I also want to mention that this meeting is always recorded and we post them on our YouTube, uh, the YouTube channel for Deed. So if you wanted to um, <clears throat> check our other forums for that past month, uh, feel free to um, visit YouTube. Um, I'll share that as well, the link for YouTube Deed. So you could uh, listen to the other um, forums that we have done. We also run a blog that we um, summarize the key points that we discussed <clears throat> so that you know if you don't want to watch the whole video, you can read through the blog. And thanks to our communication team, it's um, a special there for that. Um, again, I want to just give a moment for people to join in. And if you have any questions at the start, uh, please feel free to shoot. I know this will be our last <clears throat> meeting for the year, for the calendar year. And I'm hoping that we get to meet early enough on January. We had a discussion of making it in person, but um, we wanted to also give time for people who are joining us from greater Minnesota or any other um, region to travel uh, to Minnesota if we do an in-person, but definitely we'll do in-person and hybrid um, so that we don't leave anyone within the conversation. So again, we will, we, we, our agenda includes a um, few words from um, me here um, to do the opening remarks. And then we will go over to the Minnesota Housing Finance um, team to kind of talk about what resources um, that they, the Minnesota Housing has for, for community members that they can take advantage of. <clears throat> and also let us know what, what they, uh, they're working on and how we can uh, cooperate with community members um, because housing is a huge issue within the community and it's, it's, it can be considered as a barrier to many of the um, please unmute your, uh, mute yourself when you join um, the call. I, I keep meeting some people, but please do. Um, I have not set, um, the call to default mute you when you join. So please do feel free to just um, embrace your hand if you want to ask a question and then we can um, have you um, ask the question. Other than that, please remain muted uh, throughout the call. And we'll get to the question and answer session. We like doing the presentation and then question and answer session, follow the presentation before we move to the next presentation and then leave some time later for um, question and answers. Uh, so please um, feel free to also type your uh, questions if you have in the chat. Again, I'm just keeping at meeting people on the on the call, and we're waiting for our um, presenters to join the call as well. Uh, call will start at three thirty. That's where we'll have our first presentation. In the meantime, I can welcome anyone who has a question right up front or wants to um, um, shout out or do something or help us. Um, understand one or two issues that are within their organization. So please feel free, I'll just open that up for now as we wait for our presenters to join the call. I, I would probably take some time also to address a few key issues or key open, openings um, within DEED. As you may have known that we've advertised this position, the Assistant Commissioner for Immigrants and Refugees. And um, that is, um, I'm sure that you have received all the emails and the connect, uh, LinkedIn. And we have been trying to make sure that we get the word out there uh, to ensure there's competitiveness in the process. So please feel free to ask any questions if you have about the position. We also have. Uh, 
a position for an executive director and in our small business um, unit. That, that's a new position that, that has been created that is uh, also as, an, um, as a senior leadership team um, position that you could also go to deed and see if that is something that interests you. So I wanted to plug that out too, um, as we um, wait for our presenters to join the call. Again, we have some time, five more minutes. Um, we, we officially start this call at uh, 3.30. So please feel free to ask any questions if you have any questions before that. Someone asked in the comment in the chat if we had um, the link. I am trying to get the link, but it looks like can pull up the specific positions. I posted the general link mn.gov slash careers, and you can filter that to deed, and uh, you will see the positions that are advertised from deed. And that's the one website to go to if you are looking for any positions within the state um, agencies. And then I also posted a link for all the competitive grants and the contracting opportunities that are available. I will always do that every time. And there's a bunch of them out there that for any interested person or, or organization <clears throat> to fill in.
Again, this is a time for the community organizations, those who serve the community uh, to come together and discuss uh, some of the opportunities that are there. Um, we also bring uh, presenters to come and present on some issues or topics that we choose. And we have had um, the housing issue come up every time. And so this is something that, that some of the community members have um, asked the Office of New Americas to do um, connections, but again, we have someone from the Minnesota Housing on the line. Um, we'd like you to have Alisa um, join us today. Uh, Alisa, if you, if you want to go for it. Oh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alisa Watsamore. You see her pronouns and really appreciate the invitation um, to speak with all of you about housing. I see some familiar organizations on the line. Uh, feel free to chime in. Um, what I was thinking today to be helpful is kind of talk about who is Minnesota Housing Finance Agency? Kind of what are some of the things that we do? Um, what are some of the resources that you might want to know about? Um, and how uh, you know we might continue to build our relationship together? So um, I'll kind of kick it off, and then um, I talk fast and get excited. So slow me down. Feel free to ask questions. Um, and I have to admit, I'm looking at my talking points on another screen. So if any questions come up, if you don't mind, just uh, chime in and letting me know. Um, so again, I'm lucky to work with Minnesota Housing Finance Agency um, as their community development director, um, just high level for my role so that you know really um, kind of the slice of the pie that's all things community. How are we listening? How are we acting? How are we investing in community? And how are we making decisions with community? Um, Minnesota Housing Finance Agency kind of has this dual identity of being both a, the state's housing bank, but then also a funder with a number of programs. Um, we issue many, many grants with this really mission-driven purpose of, um, of really supporting housing stability for those throughout the state. Um, so I'll, I, like I mentioned, I'll talk about what we do, the resources we offer, but also importantly, how we do, we, how we do our work. Um, so we get um, funding from a number of places. So from the federal government, um, from the state legislature, um, if you follow the last legislative session, there was zero dollars into some of what we do and we really have felt that impact on what we're able to do. Um, but there are other ways that we still do receive some money from the state. And then we also have this pool of essentially grant funds um, that we get from some of our lending that we do. So um, again, our mission is all about housing stability and we need you, your expertise and your insights and connections as part of this big work to create a housing system that works for all individuals and communities. So one big um, part of what we do is housing development. So that's developing both affordable rental housing and own home ownership opportunities. Um, and so I'd like to highlight this both because you might, you or, or people you know might be interested in maybe being a developer on these projects or partnering with others on these projects, or you might know individuals that could really um, use housing that's developed through these funding opportunities. So um, again, that happens in the homeownership side and the multifamily side. On Thursday, we'll be announcing some new projects that we'll be, we'll be financing through some federal tax credit dollars. And again, it can look different in different communities, um, but um, generally are looking at prioritizing projects that are built um, to serve those that have income levels that are kind of on the lower end of the spectrum um, that really struggle to find housing in the general kind of market business for uh, kind of private for-profit um, area. And I also like to highlight for homeowners, we do a lot of lending through um, banks that we partner with. So one thing we like to talk about is um, the different home buyer education programs that we fund um, through different community-based organizations. And so there can be some that are ready. For example, if you're ready, you know, you want to buy a house in the next couple of months and you just kind of want to learn about the home buying process, how do you choose a loan, those types of things. We offer that type of homeownership education. And then we also fund um, homeowner ed um, education that's really, let's say, in three years, you would love to buy a home and you have that amount of time to, to figure out how to build your credit, 
what kind of you know, savings for down payment that you need to have in place, where there might be um, funding that can assist you, kind of all the different things that are involved in, own, in owning a home, but really having a longer time to sort of learn that process to be ready to buy a home. We also offer um, down payment assistance. Um, Mortgages, some that have lower low, um, lower zero interest loans, we offer grants and loans to make repair emergency repairs, or if you wanted to remodel your house. Again, the level, kind of the interest rate or needing to pay it off kind of depends on income level. Um, and again, an important part of this homeownership for those that want to become home, homeowners is that we have contracts with organizations um, that share the cultural identity and speak the languages of those aspiring homeowners. Um, and we found that that really has helped build trust to know who you can trust in the home buying world. Um, we definitely are aware of the issues around contract for deed or other kind of, not that all contract for deed arrangements are predatory, but definitely some of the predatory lending that has happened in the name of helping people become homeowners. So that trust has been really important. Um, and then for manufactured housing, so um, manufactured or mobile home parks, you might be aware of, there's two types of, of um, assistance that we can offer. Um, one is in, to individuals. So if a, a homeowner um, living in a manufactured home needs resources, um, let's say to do some repairs on their home, they can access those through a participating lender. And then I've learned that recently, um, if the cost of repairs really exceed the home value, you could potentially use those funds to replace your home. Um, there's also some grants around uh, infrastructure, so much needed sewer repairs, electrical repairs, and other community type repairs. Um, and then kind of switching to the rental side, we do offer rental assistance um, in a number of different ways. Um, I'm sure you, many of you were familiar with the emergency rental assistance program associated with COVID-19 called Rent Help Amen. Um, although that was sunsetted when the funds were spent we, do, we are still funding housing stability services. And those are really important because they focus on, you know, there are resources still out there, but it's a maze for how to figure out how to reach the, get those resources. So this is what we're funding different organizations to do to really figure out what um, resources they might be available for so that they can um, keep their housing. We are also through that program um, doing some eviction prevention work. So if you know of anyone that might need some help with kind of navigating the system or eviction prevention, um, please call uh, 211 or there's an email address I can put in the chat. And one thing I wanted to talk about that's um, more of like a, we would really love your in insights and input, is we've received additional funds from the federal government which is about 75 million left in emergency rental assistance funds. Although that sounds like an, a lot, it's not enough to just reopen the Rent Help MN program, but we would love your thoughts on how to prioritize, prioritize those funds. Um, they could be used for targeted emergency rental assistance for households combined with those housing stability services. Um, and another use that we could use them for is to develop and preserve more rental housing that is affordable we could use about 61 million of that. So I will be talking about a lot of different resources and I'm happy to put a few things in the chat, but follow up with a nice reference document um, as well. Um, and then again, specific to different rental assistance programs, um, it's a little bit in the weeds and it's, like I mentioned, it's unfortunately pretty complicated. Um, a lot of rental assistance is available through the counties. We also do some rental assistance through various providers, um, and there's a list where you could find that. And again, I'll provide that a bit later. Um, if um, someone is uh, at risk of homelessness or experiencing homelessness, there's a different, again, there's there's different providers that can be contacted. And then I always like to talk about if, if someone is facing um, kind of legal, has legal concerns or issues about being a renter. They're not sure if their renter's rights are being upheld. There's a few different legal services organizations um, that can be contacted. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk about um, one other resource and then kind of switch to more of a conversation. Um, and we don't let me know if we're running out of time, but um, the Home Help MN program. So that's emergency that's assistance for homeowners, which is also funded by the federal government as part of the COVID um, emergency rental or uh, sorry, the COVID emergency um, funding dollars. So homeowners can be eligible for up to fifty thousand dollars who um, own a home and they live in it as their main residence. 
They're below um, the income limits. They've experienced a financial hardship after January 21st of 2020, and they have past due expenses and one or more categories covered by the program. This could include overdue mortgage, pay um, mortgage payments, things like property taxes, manufactured housing loans and lot rent, contract for deed payments. Um, there's a number of different things. And so um, this program is open as long as there are funds available. Um, and we really wanna make sure that um, if somebody is in a situation where they're worried about you know, going into foreclosure or something like that, 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 that please do let them know to apply for the program. Um, it is available, uh, the website's in several languages, and then um, help can be provided in a number of different languages as well. Um, so I'll pause for a second and see if there's any questions in the chat. Okay, so next I wanted to talk about some of the other things. So we have a lot of different resources and um, we want to reach all the communities in Minnesota, but also we're making a lot of decisions about those resources. And like I mentioned with, um, you know, the survey that is going out around that um, remaining rental emergency rental assistance. Well, we are also starting a strategic planning process that I know some places that use strategic planning, you know, do the work, put it on a shelf and don't do anything with it. I should say at Minnesota Housing, it really does direct how we do our work and, you know, the funds that we're prioritizing in the staffing. Um, I don't know if um, you'd be comfortable with this assistant commissioner, but I have a few questions for the group to make it a little more interesting and interactive if, the, if we have time? Please do. Great, well, I'll first pause and say, you know, are there any questions? Again, I've prioritized just sort of running through the 101. Any initial questions, thoughts so far? Please raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask questions. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, so regarding, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> My voice is not me. Um, regarding oh, clients oh, that have, um, if they have like, a, they don't have like a social security number, but they have an iTunes number, are they still able to apply for this uh, resource? Counselor? Yes. Yes, we do. Um, okay. iTunes numbers yep. are accepted. Are you talking about the home health program? Yes. Yes, and ITIN numbers are also accepted for the, um, called like a rehab or emergency loan program. Um, we definitely heard that related to manufactured housing. We heard from a number of um, community members that said, please accept ITIN so that people can access these funds. So we were able to make that um, an option. Great question. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. I heard someone else unmute. Any other questions? I'll turn it over to just a couple questions. Again, I think this um, makes for more interesting conversation, especially virtually. Um, but if if anyone would like to chime in or feels comfortable or feel free to email me after the fact, um, what are some of the, again, this would really help our strategic planning process. And I'm happy to come back if you want a more formal um, process as well. But, um, how can Minnesota Housing more effectively partner with you and or support you and your work in the community and the community itself? If anyone would like to share. Hey, yeah, Lisa, this is Sam from the Global Father Foundation. How are you? Good, nice to see you. Good. I just want to say thank you so much, everybody, uh, especially a team from the Minnesota Housing. Uh, we are actually uh, in one of the programs whereby we engage our community about housing, uh, especially mortgage. And it has been, uh, I can say, uh, successful. You know, they've been on the ground making sure that uh, those people who are late on their mortgage, uh, they're getting resources, especially those ones who are, who are uh, impacted by COVID, uh, by COVID uh, after last year. So uh, there's been so much, we've been doing a lot on the ground, making sure that people are getting the information. And now I reach out to the housing uh, department team. Thank you for your support. And they're always there. Uh, they're just on top of the game answering questions here. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, thanks for chiming in. I remember we got to meet each other during the grant process, but it'd be nice to meet in person someday. But yeah, that's an example, right? Where um, really the success of our programs is that, that um, trusted community, community organizations are getting the word out about them. And I saw someone unmute, go for it. Yeah, I just have uh, some clarification. A lot of 
new immigrants uh, grow in families and they mostly live in the twin cities. And if they want to purchase a first home, is there any assistance program that can help them? Because a lot of times uh, the, the initial payment or those are very barrier. I mean, like, uh, I don't think they can come up with the with the housing prices that went up last few years. Is there any program that helped them uh, the initial uh, either the down payment or something like that? Yes, yes, definitely. So we do um, we do uh, partner with lenders. So we have different um, loan products, including down payment assistance. Um, a lot of what our, our work is done through other people, so you don't always know that it's coming through us, but our down payment assistance is one such example. Um, it, it is really important because it allows people who, you know, are probably paying the same in their mortgage as they would, or the, paying the same in rent as they would for a mortgage, but it's how do you get that um, kind of bucket of funds to pay for that? So um, there's just different participating lenders, and I can um, I'll also be sure to share the link to that. So you just reach out to one of the participating lenders. Um, as long as you fall within the income limits um, of under $134,800, um, you could uh, qualify for those resources. And it's up to 17,000, um, I believe, in the down payment assistance um, that you could receive. Thank you. I lost track of who raised their hand first. Um, Shira? Oh, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, my name is Shira. I'm from uh, Central Minnesota Community Empowerment Organization. Uh, we do a lot of work here in Central Minnesota, especially in St. Cloud area, uh, working with immigrant population. I do have a question, and uh, I think that uh, the question you asked is really interesting coming from uh, Department of Housing. Uh, but uh, the question that I had is how how do you how do you select what partners or what uh, organizations that you that will get the word out? Because we have had uh, experience uh, with uh, with some of the COVID uh, reliefs, especially when uh, and we're dealing with it and with the same problem with uh, with Home Help Minnesota. Uh, we had uh, some issues with uh, uh, Rent Help Minnesota, where uh, the funding really went uh, to big organizations and uh, those organizations in terms of. Uh, in terms of accountability of uh, the kind, the level of work that they were doing, or the level of access that they had to those communities that had the most need, was really uh, questionable. Uh, because as an organization, a small immigrant organization, uh, we we were filling out applications, and by the end of that application process, I think we've done uh, close to four thousand applications. And in fact, we were not even a partners. We had our local county support uh, some of the. The, some of our staff to uh, to do that application and to have uh, that capacity. So we have seen the need uh, for a lot of times, you know, there's really uh, an intricate and really nice uh, application process that uh, the agencies put together. But in return, uh, there's always a gap uh, where the individuals that most need the help with technology and language are left out because the organizations or or the the institutions or the the individuals that have access to those individuals are not being empowered by uh, by some of the agencies. So what I wanted to see is how you want to go uh, around that uh, that uh, that resource, the disconnectivity with uh, with the resource and the people that actually most need it. That's a really good question. Um, know that specifically for rent help. Home Help and a few other grants um, that I'm kind of connected with that we have always, we have intentionally built in, you know, what are your qualifications as it relates to your relation, direct relationships with the individuals that might need these funds? Um, how is your organization by and for the very communities that we hope to reach with these funds? Um, so I should say in the grant review and, and scoring process, we we do our best to have make sure that that is capturing what you shared, right? Those organizations that are on the ground that are um, turned to by the community for these types of resources. Um, but I, you know, thanks for the feedback that sometimes what seems like a good process doesn't always lead to actually connecting those dots. Um, so 
I think um, with each grant, one, I'm sorry, one second, my child just came home from school and is making a lot of noise. One second. Okay. So sorry about that. Um, and so thank you for the feedback. I know that um, with each grant that we do, we really work to change kind of the types of questions we're asking um, I know for some of the grants that I run, I do an interview process, and that's gotten us closer to um, identifying which um, organizations have that authentic connection. That's a really great point. Thank you. And then uh, Fatumata. Hey, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. I wanted to know if, because I'm a mortgage loan officer in a brokerage, and sometimes the lenders that we work with do are not aligned with your programs, if we wanted to add a lender to your program, are there steps to do that? And if there is, where which resource can I tap into? Yes, there's definitely um, ways to uh, become a, a lender with Minnesota Housing. Um, I will follow up, there's some experts. So my um, colleague, uh, Christina Canola, is, uh, works closely with um, different, uh, different organizations or um, finance institutions that would want to be participating lenders. So I will put her email address in the chat. She, um, I just know her very well and she is really committed to creating the access um, to these programs. So great question. Thank you. And uh, we had a question in the chat. I don't know if we, we answered that. Second about the, the ethnic demographics of the people uh, receiving the support. Um, to MHFA, um, curious which communities are accessing the resource and where we could do more outreach. So we do track those um, demographics. Um, I know for the various programs that we run, um, definitely for Rent Help MN, we would report those demographics on what we call our JAP dashboard. Um, and we uh, were intentional to include um, demographics for applicants beyond kind of the a very limited uh, scope of identity because we know that um, one thing we've heard a lot from communities is to disaggregate data. So you know, within one checkbox right on a demographic list, there's a number of different um, ethnicities and cultures, and it's important that we know who those are. So I know that we that's a too long of an answer, Alexis, but definitely we have been intentional kind of in home help and rent help um, in our own uh, mortgage lending. Um, we've now reached 40% of our borrowers are um, households of color, indigenous households. So we've worked hard to really increase the representation. Um, so yes, but also you know, part of it is there's always more to do. That's a great question. Let's see, any other questions? I'm trying to see if I see any more hands. Yeah, yeah so I, if I could I, just ask a quick follow up. Um, where do we, is there a place where that data would be accessible to the public? Yes, yes. So um, I know definitely for rent help and home help that that's posted. Um, we do report on our other types of data. I think it's through some of our annual reports and things like that. Um, so I can find, find that for you as well. Awesome, thank you. Great, great. I, I do have uh, another unrelated question. Uh, we, you know, a lot of the a lot of the housing issues that we see they're they're really varied and uh, and a lot of the times you know heartbreaking. But what uh, one thing that we really see in a common trend is uh, or or some solution that we have you know we've been looking at or thinking about is. Uh, if they were a developers of color, because a lot of the times it's the property managers and the and the, and the landlords that are causing a lot of problems for immigrant populations in terms of their homes, uh, and 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 being renters, and we're seeing a lot more uh, evictions and uh, and non-contract renewals, which means. Uh, that that, uh, that landlords and property managers are just deciding who's going to live there and who's has to leave year after year. So. One thing that we've really been thinking about that uh, that we thought might be uh, might be a sort of uh, of, of uh, alleviating part of the problems would be having uh, having uh, developers of color, 
So is there is there a way that uh, that uh, that the housing uh, the housing agency is uh, supporting developers of color and and trying to diversify the pool of of developers and, uh, and 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 other people that are managing these properties? That is another um, excellent question and something um, we've definitely been uh, aware of. I would say what's tricky is the Fair Housing Act wouldn't allow us to create a a lending product or a, an a award on the basis of race, um, even though we know that um, developers of color haven't had the same access kind of to the industry over the years. Um, so one thing, a few things that we have been doing um, where we are allowed to is, you know, how I mentioned the multifamily development awards that we give out, and these are in the millions of dollars. We do um, have pointing categories. So in other words, you score more points, you're more likely to be selected. If um, the developer, the construction team uh, has a, um, a black indigenous or person of color within as the developer within the team itself. And there's, we've increased those points over the years so that we're looking to avoid those um, situations where someone, we've heard a lot from developers of color themselves that you know it can be really tokenizing or they haven't had the same level of authority. So we've worked hard to increase the points for that. Um, We've also done been intentional to provide more information, what we call technical assistance. So kind of um, assistance with how to navigate our different development processes um, to developers and um, are looking to be more flexible and connect with resources. There are more, um, I would say the nonprofit sector has some more flexibility than government in terms of being able to be more intentional with targeting. Um, so that for example, there's a few different organizations that can pro provide different funds and they have received grants through my capacity building grant program to do that work. Um, so that's sort of kind of indirectly how we're able to support, um, but it's definitely recognizes a need. I think again, unfortunately we couldn't have like a direct lending program, but we could um, over, you know, in the future, it would be really great if we could have some kind of access to financing for newer developers in the field. There's a lot of industry interest in that, so I think there's some opportunities there as well. I did see a question in the chat um, from Tom and Shale. Um, are there funds for home help and rent help, uh, promotional dollars to be used in ethnic media, as was the case earlier? Um, so I know that we've worked uh, with um, a media group called NECA Creative, um, which is led by um, people of color and, and immigrants um, to have a really culturally appropriate specific marketing technique. Um, I don't know where things are at with home help, um, but I think um, I'll bring it back that it would be good to do another uh, promotional pitch because we still do have funds available. Um, and that's something we continue to think about, not just for those programs, but as we go into the strategic planning process, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, like that as well. Um, because we know that that's been really successful at reaching communities. Let's see. I'm not sure how we're doing on time. Um, I'm happy to. We are good on time. I think we're right on time. Four o'clock, we'll start our next presentation. But I think um, Heather is already on the call. If there are no any other questions, I would uh, go ahead and move to the next uh, part of our call today. Uh, invite Heather Stein, who leads our uh, DEI office, and she will explain more um, how that works. Heather, please. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Excellent. Give me just one second and I'll pull up my um, presentation here. All right, can you see that? Okay. Um, do you have, can yeah, you hear we me? We can see that, yeah, we can all hear. Okay, and you can see, see the slides? Thank you. 
Perfect. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you all a little bit about our Office of Diversity and Equal Opportunity that I lead at DEED. Um, I wanted to take some time simply to introduce our team to you and share about what we do at within our team at DEED. Um, I'm the director for our office and we have four people. Um, we say we are a small but mighty team. Um, so I serve as the Equal Opportunity and Diversity Director for the Agency for Internal Affairs. And then I also serve as the state level Equal Opportunity Officer when it comes to um, WIOA uh, programming. And I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Um, on my team, I have uh, Karen Lillidal working with me. She is our WIOA Equal Opportunity Compliance Manager and also oversees our Americans with Disabilities Act coordination. Carly Turner is our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator, and Jennifer Cole is our Equal Opportunity and Access Coordinator. So in the time that we have together, like I said, I want to share a little bit about the work that we do in our office. And at the end of our time together, my goal is to um, help to increase awareness of the resources and tools available to um, Minnesota immigrants and refugees that will assist them in seeking uh, employment or credentials or, or training skills that are of interest. Um, so these will kind of fall under two different buckets of equal opportunity and language access. So in our office, we have a lot of responsibilities split up between the four of us, um, but we have um, been able to create really strong partnerships with folks at different at the programmatic level and with stakeholders throughout the state um, to help enforce the the policies and regulations that um, we're responsible for. So first and foremost, we have to prioritize our compliance work. So we enforce deeds diverse, um, excuse me, discrimination and harassment and sexual harassment prohibited policies. So we respond to complaints and then we provide training and consultation to um, our employees and also our um, WIOA funding recipients about what their responsibilities are. We, like I mentioned, are responsible for the federal equal opportunity compliance and monitoring. So under the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, the dollars that are sent to DEED through the federal, um, federal WIOA dollars we're responsible for ensuring that all of the entities that receive this federal funding are in compliance with equal opportunity and ADA requirements. So our office oversees that those efforts and goes out and monitors um, the recipients from time to time. We are also responsible for language access and ensuring that our employees know how to um, make make sure that everyone um, contacting our office or utilizing our services, um, that our staff are providing um, that content in a language that is spoken by, um, by the individual that's reaching out to us. As far as affirmative action goes, we have a agency affirmative action plan that covers recruitment, retention, um, and all employment related activities. We oversee ADA accommodations and accessibility for our staff and also diversity, equity, and inclusion programming, training, and consultation. So what this actually looks like on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we partner with HR to maintain inclusive hiring processes. Um, sometimes we work with them to help connect them to diverse um, recruitment sources, for example. We provide leadership and support to DEED's senior leaders to reach their equity goals. We monitor equal opportunity and ADA compliance. As I mentioned, we do site visits where we go out and we actually, um, we interview staff, we interview customers, we break out the tape measure and make sure that physical spaces meet ADA um, compliance requirements and that the folks who use wheelchairs, for example, are able to access um, services that the that, that entity provides. We assist employees with providing language access to clients and customers, set up those ADA accommodations through an interactive process, administer the complaints program, 
and we lead diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, learning opportunities for staff and stakeholders, um, such as in our intercultural skills development program. We have monthly diversity spotlights, um, community reflections, where we invite employees in to have a conversation about um, something that has happened um, maybe outside of work, but has an impact on the people um, doing the work at our agency. And then also holding space for courageous conversations. And a lot of our work, like I said, it really focuses on meeting compliance requirements. Um, but what we really want to spend our time doing, and we've been kind of shifting our makeup to help us get into a position where we can be proactive and educate others about their responsibilities and how to do things well and meeting the needs of Minnesotans. So those compliance pieces, um, I'm sure many of you are aware of a number of the equal opportunity laws. In our time together, I just wanted to, you know, under underscore these that we have equal opportunity laws on a federal level and a state level um, as a government agency, um, deed as a, a government agency. So under WIOA, that Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, because we receive that federal funding, mm -hmm. um, we enforce equal opportunity in that an individual cannot be excluded from participating in, uh, being denied the benefits of, or otherwise subjected to discrimination under any WIOA Title I funded activity um, or program based on national origin. And within national origin um, language, and limited English proficiency are important considerations. For national origin discrimination, treating anyone adversely because they are from a particular country or part of the world, because of ethnicity or accent, or because the recipient perceives the individual to be of a certain national origin, even if they are not, cannot be discriminated against. And at the state level, in our Minnesota Human Rights Act, we have a public service clause state that states it's unfair. Um, it is an unfair discriminatory, discriminatory practice to discriminate against any person in the access to, admission to, or full utilization of benefits from any public service because of race, color, creed, national origin, religion, disability, sex, sexual orientation, or status with regard to a public assistance, for example. So there are a number of other um, equal opportunity laws that would be relevant, but these are the three that I wanted to highlight for you today. So when it comes to helping individuals who are um, immigrants to Minnesota or new Americans, or they're utilizing, they're wanting to access any of the programs or services that we provide at DEED or through any of our um, local workforce areas. Uh, remember that equal opportunity is the law. So if anybody is running into barriers that they have rights, and I wanna make sure that you all know where to find that information, and you can certainly reach out to me too. Um, keep in mind that language access is required for all of those organizations that receive federal funds. So the first class states that we, any organization that receives that federal funding needs to make meaningful access to reach limited English proficient individuals um, so that they are served effectively and they're informed about or able to participate in a program or activity fully. And to ensure that individuals who are not English proficient speakers, um, but have a, di a different primary language that's spoken, we are required to share a Babel notice um, for all of our programming that receives Title I funding. And that Babel notice indicates that appropriate um, language assistance is required. So converting any of our materials, such as hard copy of letters, applications, complaint forms, or decisions um, are posted online and then also need to be translated for individuals who are limited English proficient. So on the right side of this screen, I have a copy of what a Babel notice looks like. So if anybody needs um, any materials interpreted, um, they can they can call our language line and that information is on the Babel notice as well. 
So each agency, I believe, um, contracts with the Department of Administration, and there's a language line that can be can be used. Um, and then another thing that people often use who work for state government is called an iSpeak card. Um, so that's another resource that folks can ask for or look for um, if they need any assistance with language translation. And one thing that I had shared um, recently with um, a couple of folks on the call is that we have converted our Know Your Right to Fair Treatment brochures to 12 different languages, the 12 most um, commonly spoken languages across the state of Minnesota. So this Know Your Rights to Fair Treatment brochure um, is on our Deeds um, Equal Opportunity website. And in the brochure, it describes that you know equal opportunity is the law and that everyone deserves equal access to our programs and services that we administer at our agency. Um, so as you can see, we have translated um, this information into English, Amharic, Arabic, Hmong, Karen, Khmer. If I, if somebody catches me saying anything incorrectly, please correct me because I want to, I want to say things correctly. Laotian, Russian, simplified Chinese, Somali, Spanish, and Vietnamese. And I have a link to these documents at the end of the slide deck so I can share that out with you as well. And I know many of you work on um, or contribute to agencies' um, language access plans, or um, you may have heard about language access planning in these roundtable conversations. So DEED does have a language access plan, and we are currently working on updating that plan in our office. And these are just kind of these are kind of the steps um, that we are following. Uh, right now, so we have been assessing the LEP communities in our service areas and assessing how individuals um, who have uh, more limited English proficiency, how they interact with our agency. So we've looked at, you know, the, the top utilized, um, the top languages that have been um, Utilize, that the language line has been utilized for, um, and we work with our local workforce equal opportunity officers um, to learn more about the prominent languages spoken in each um, local area across the state. We have gathered information about the employees at our agency who um, have multilingual skills. We are currently collecting um, a, a, a resource that lists community organizations that are trusted by targeted communities across the state. So we can work with them and ensure that people are accessing information um, about the programs and services that we provide and um, to kind of help bridge the gap in overcoming um, some lack of, lack of trust or maybe lack of awareness. We are looking to partner with community organizations so we need to update our language access policy and procedures. We'll require updates to notices of language assistance services for all of the programs that are administered at our agency. And then we'll have to train staff and our local equal opportunity officers about any, um, well, a refresh on what uh, requirements continue but then also training on any new requirements um, will be helpful for us to get things right. And from there, we will monitor for compliance, evaluate the effectiveness, provide technical support, and um, you know, continue to implement uh, updates that help us to mitigate those language barriers that we currently have across the state. And a couple of resources and tools that I wanted to make sure you're all aware of. Um, I have links to our equal opportunity resources on Dean's external website, and that includes links to our affirmative action plan. Um, again, so if anyone's looking for information about employment um, and good faith efforts to diversify an organization, that, that can be found there. Our WIOA non-discrimination plan, um, which has nine different elements. One of them is focused on affirmative outreach, um, and that includes language access as well. 
Um, so all local workforce areas also are required to implement a language access plan. So that's something that might be helpful to you um, based on where you're at throughout the state. Those know your right to fair treatment brochures, uh, the WIOA policy manual is there, as well as our discrimination complaint form and our contact information if anyone has questions about um, you know, being treated in a discriminatory manner, they can certainly reach out to us if they want have some questions on what to do. And then on our WIOA page, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act page, that includes those state the state level plan, and then also regional and local workforce area plans. So that was kind of a, a quick overview of lots of stuff that we do at our agency um, and a number of resources that might be helpful to you all. Um, but with that, I, I'd love to answer any questions that people have. Um, and I can stay on for the remainder of the, the call to answer questions either um, verbally or through the chat. Thank you, Heather. Um, any questions? Okay. Come down and please ask if we have a, um, we can send the pres presentation. Uh, so please feel free to do that. Um, I think you can stop sharing your screen, I think, Heather. This is my side. Yep. Thank you. You didn't want to look at yourself on, on my screen? <laughs> yeah, I've seen this already. <clears throat> yes, um, Lisa, thank you for the question. I'll send that to uh, Deputy Commissioner, excuse me, Assistant Commissioner Mohammed, and we'll get that out to everyone on the call. I have another question. And I included live okay. links in there, so you can use it as a resource. Okay, that's great with the links because we do um, job seeker training for immigrants and we always cover knowing your rights. And so some of your brochures and other information, I'm really excited to be able to include those in our programming. So thank you. Oh, good. Yes, thank you for being intentional to share those out with folks too. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Perfect. Then I think we're right on time. Uh, Sherwa, you had a question? Yes, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, th thank you for putting this together, by the way. Uh, I, I think I just have a quick question out of curiosity. Uh, and my question is, you know, you mentioned that uh, the deed is doing a uh, mapping of uh, organizations that serve targeted populations. So my question is, how do you do that mapping and how, how do you go about that? Thanks for the question. We are, we're currently working with our local work for, local workforce equal opportunity officers. So we have 16 um, boards throughout the state of Minnesota that we're working with for them to identify, like I said, some of the larger populations um, in their communities and then identifying the community organizations that serve those targeted populations. And the next step will be for us to pull all of those together. Um, the difficulty I think will be in maintaining such a list, but I think it's important that we have a, a good starting place um, and if you have suggestions on, on that or how we maintain, I'd certainly love to hear from you or others in this group. I hope that answers your question, Sharwa. Um, we can go ahead to Birma. You had a question, your hands is raised. Yes, uh, thank you so much for organizing the event. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, my name is Gurma. I'm from um, Ormo Community of Minnesota. And um, I'm just wondering, uh, your office doing such a great job. Uh, however, I'm just wondering how you guys reach to community-based organizations such as ours. Uh, what kind of strategy you use? Uh, maybe the other question that I have is how we can work with you and how we can assist your office in many possible ways to reach out to uh, 
our community and our life. That's a really great question. I think jumping off of the kind of tying that into the last one, we're in early phases um, of collecting this information. So I appreciate your interest in the, the intent for partnership. So we are hopefully going to be creating this office of new Americans in the next few months. Um, so I think all of the partnerships and relationships that have been built out of the Immigrant and Refugee Affairs Office um, and our Office of Diversity and Equal Opportunity will have to come together um, to start creating such a list. And so our office can pull in what we have from our local equal opportunity officers. But I'm also aware that there's likely gaps there too around awareness. So I think it's important that we are intentional um, to bring in insight and recommendations from members of this group as well. So it's not fully mapped out yet, but I think that even, you know, the questions that you're asking are, are helping, helping me to think through how we can be um, more strategic and comprehensive and in, in putting together such a resource. Uh, Heather, I wanted to add, uh, I know you mentioned uh, collecting ideas of how to maintain that list, but I think a lot of the times, especially for uh, us new immigrants and uh, just uh, being the first generation, maybe to uh, try to understand the system and maybe do more for our, for our communities on our own and do the actual work for, for our communities. I think some of the challenges that we're meeting is uh, those special lists, the, the list that you are talking about. So uh, I'm, I'm here in central Minnesota and there have been lists yeah, yeah. that have been in place for a lot of the agencies for 20, 30 years, but the population has changed, the needs have shifted. Uh, and, and there's really, uh, the institutions move so slow that, uh, that, that the changes are not happening to say, oh, who's on the ground now? Who is connecting to the change in population in that region or in that area? So I think uh, maintaining uh, itself has been an obstacle to us. And I, I don't know if maintaining uh, the same sort of list would, uh, would, uh, would be beneficial. Uh, just a follow-up question. Uh, who are the 16 boards? Who, do you know off the top of your head uh, who would be for Central Minnesota? For Central Minnesota? Um, you know what? I don't have it off the top of my head, but I'll look it up quick and I can pop that in the chat for you. Sounds good. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shira. Thank you so much. Those are all great questions. I think we're running out of time. We'll go over to the next part of our presentation. I have Lillian Tien on the line to talk about the uh, down payment assistance uh, grant program of the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Lillian, welcome. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. I don't know if my thing is going to work here. Uh, I am going to uh, thank you for this opportunity, first of all. Thank you so much for uh, bringing us here to talk about our down payment assistance program. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. My colleague Jenny is supposed to be doing this, giving this presentation, but she's away. Uh, she's the subject matter expert on this. Um, let me see. Let me know what if you see my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes. You do? Because I can't see you guys. I think your screen is very clear. Okay, so you can see the presentation? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so I, sorry, did somebody say something? If you want to put it on a slideshow. Okay, slide. Let me see here. How about that? That's a good, yeah. Good, okay. Yes. So I'm gonna talk about, um, and, and again, I, I cannot see you guys cause I just have one screen. So please maybe hold your questions uh, when we're done or if if it's really pertinent, then maybe somebody can just feel free to stop me and, and I'll try and answer. So we have a down payment assistance. Uh, first of all, my name is Lilia Notian. I'm with the Department of Agriculture. I'm the Outreach and Engagement uh, Coordinator for uh, at the Commissioner's Office, uh, and I coordinate the new Office of Emerging, Emerging Farmers. So this down payment assistance program 
was actually brought about due to the work of the Emerging Farmers Working Group members who uh, put this request uh, forward as one of those uh, items that would perhaps be helpful uh, for emerging farmers. And hence, our Rural Finance Authority team is uh, managing this grant and therefore putting this out. I'm working closely with them along with other partners. And as you know, this Office of Emerging Farmers is a one person office, so I can't do everything. So we have some of these um, products managed by others in the agency. So um, the down payment assistance program, essentially what, what this is about is first time farm owners, those who are interested in purchasing a farm uh, can receive uh, up to $15,000 in matching uh, grant monies uh, to purchase a farm. So the legislature did award us uh, 500,000 uh, for the first round. So that means that we'll be able to, to provide about 30 to 40 grants um, depending on, on how much folks request. The, the cap, the maximum you can ask for is 15,000. Uh, this is going to be on a first come first serve basis. Uh, those applications are opening uh, January 4th at uh, 8 a.m. Uh, if you send your application before, I'm sorry, 9 a.m. If you send your application before 9 a.m. on January 4th, uh, it will not be honored. So it's so important to make sure that if folks are applying, they, they, they do that right about 9 a.m. Uh, January 4th. We're gonna have additional rounds of this funding um, each at 750,000. And that's going to be, uh, the second round is going to be July, 2023 and uh, a following round again, um, July, 2024. Now, who is eligible for this funding? So uh, non uh, LLCs, partnerships, nonprofits and other businesses are not uh, eligible because this is supposed to be uh, for an individual owner or uh, a, you know, a spouse uh, and significant other applying uh, to purchase their first farmland uh, or other agricultural property. Uh, like I said, um, some of the uh, requirements are that uh, you not make more than 250,000 annually in gross agricultural sales. Um, so if you're within that income bracket, then you will qualify. Uh, the other requirement is that you provide majority of the labor uh, and management of the farm for at least five years. If you choose not to continue farming uh, before the five years, you would have to, uh, the M Rural Finance Authority will calculate what that means in terms of how much money you'd have to uh, provide back to to the MDA or Rural Finance Authority. You also have to be in good standing with the state of Minnesota, and this is something that is in statute and really taken seriously. And you must not have uh, been convicted of any state or federal criminal offense related to any uh, grant agreement. Now, uh, what is eligible for purchase is that farmland that I talked about, and that has to be within Minnesota's borders. Uh, the time frame for this opportunity is once you're approved, uh, you have 90 days uh, to, 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 to make that purchase and, and, and to complete that process, or May 15th, whichever is uh, whichever comes first. So you cannot, um, one, we are not going to honor purchases that uh, were made uh, prior to that approval. And uh, we will not honor any uh, purchases of, uh, of other uh, land beyond uh, land that you are actually going to farm. Additionally, uh, if there is a residential home uh, within that land that you intend to purchase, uh, they will uh, will have to subtract the value uh, of that um, of that home. Um, and factor that in based on, you know, what you're asking. Um, also matching cash loans and other grants are, um, are, are, are important for, for one to consider because you do have to have, um, you do have to have a, a matching grant. Uh, and I should mention that uh, while 
a home is not, uh, well, a home would be, sub, the value of a home will be subtracted if it's on that land. However, if it's an agricultural building, building like a barn or um, a greenhouse, that is, uh, that is definitely uh, eligible. Um, so these are the ways to apply. Um, you can go online at the on the MDA website, and after this, I will I will share that information uh, and apply there. Or uh, you can actually request for um, for a form for us to actually send you that uh, a form so that you can fill out and mail uh, the form for your application. But remember, it is first come first serve. So one of the best bets is to try and see if you can do that application online. Uh, this will close uh, after we receive 100 applications, uh, whether that comes first or uh, the cutoff date uh, comes first. Um, after you're approved uh, and, and you know you after you're approved, uh, your application is approved, uh, there will be additional requests for you to provide a purchase agreement, loan estimate, and your federal uh, tax uh, filing. Uh, information and this is kind of the timeline of how this would this might play out uh, when you begin your application process maybe you're going to get some matching funds from either FSA or a bank or uh, other means uh, then you apply for this for this opportunity once you're approved you have those 90 days uh, to, 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 to actually go through that process. And then of course you will be asked, you, you will be asked once you are approved of uh, uh, the additional, uh, additional information. And actually after the purchase of, of that farmland, we will also require some items uh, to show that you indeed did purchase uh, that farmland as, as, you, as you requested. Um, additional resources can be found on our webpage, like I said, and I'm going to put those links in the chat because I'm doing that right now uh, by myself. But I also wanted to mention that uh, on the 15th of December from 6 to 7 p.m., we're going to have an informational session. We did have one uh, on the 6th, but there is an additional one coming up on the on the 15th. So if you have any more questions, that would be a good time to join that call uh, and Jenny will be available to answer most of these questions. And with that, I think I stand for questions. If I can figure out how to get out of this, uh, out of the, the presentation. And thank you. Thank you so much, Lillian. Um, if you have any questions, again, you can always submit yourself or type it in the chat. Um, yes, please feel free. We are about two minutes behind, uh, beyond the time, so we can squeeze one or two questions. If not, we can wrap it up. Well, again, you can always follow up with me via email to ask any questions of any of the presenters that we have here today. If you need any resource information or presentations that you need to be shared with, um, I'll be free. Please reach out to me and I can get that for you. Germa, I see your hand is up. Yes, I have a quick question for her. Is there any stated land, farmland, that is stated by the government be sold? Germa, you're asking if there's any land with the, uh, that the government has that they're selling. Is, is that the question? Yes. No, uh, we 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 cannot we cannot identify land that uh, should be sold or will be sold. Uh, but I'm sure the counties uh, and cities um, offices would have that information. But unfortunately, we cannot we cannot actually identify any pieces of land that is uh, that is being sold. Good but Gir Girma, uh, I just remembered, but however, we do have a program called FarmLink, uh, which that's great. I'm going to share that with the assistant commissioner as part of his, what he will send out. We do have FarmLink, which actually lists uh, land that is available by uh, landowners who are uh, interested in selling their land. So that is also a great program to go into that uh, platform and see 
who is selling their land? Those are individual uh, farmers selling their land. Perfect, thank you so much. You're welcome. I see we don't have any other questions. Um, sorry to keep you waiting for a while. We have, uh, we are about five minutes past 4.30. I'll be happy to um, wrap this up. There's no other questions. We do send out, uh, we, we record these um, calls and we put them on the YouTube and we do a blog post. So I say that in the start of the call and I will repeat that. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions after the call. And then thank you so much everyone for joining us. Happy holiday season and see you on this forum next year, January, 2023. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for organizing. Thank you, Irma.